Hi, I'm Kristen Remington. Thank you for joining us along this road to recovery as we tackle the scary, complicated, crippling and powerful issue of addiction. I can't just take one drink. I drink and before I know it, I gotta have another one and another one and another one and another one and another one. When I first got busted, I was 105 pounds. And it slowly kills you. I mean, I've been drinking since I was little, 10, 11. I don't want to do it no more. You know, I, I, I wasted so much time. Time on the streets where drugs prey on the lonely and where alcohol reigns, where a desire to live is trumped by finding that quick fix and where shadows of their demons rise as the sun sets, leaving the hopeless to wonder, will they survive the night? I mean, I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't. Of course I was scared. Not far from the 24-hour liquor stores and free casino booze, a handful of men find refuge here, the lucky ones perhaps. This is the Salvation Army, best known for taking in all your old goods, but the faith-based mission here goes beyond recycling donations. Well, we recycle lives. Lives of all ages, races, income and religions, these are the faces of addiction a disease that does not discriminate, yet one that often seems impossible to beat. Are we winning? And uh, I think so. If we, if we just get one, you only have to get one. Steve Charter is the Director of Rehabilitation Services through the Salvation Army's Adult Rehabilitation Center. The six-month work therapy program provides things like counseling, spiritual care, and anger management in drug classes for men who've lost the ability to cope and provide for themselves, all while putting a roof over their heads, shoes on their feet, and nourishment in their bodies. We have um, alcoholics, we have drug addicts here, we have people who have been in prison for 25 years. A lot of their life was spent in prison, they just don't know how to live life. Much less live sober. While some succeed, others struggle with sobriety, as you are about to see for yourself. We followed three men, Chris, Mike, and Pat, through this program. We lost one, another made it through, and the third is still fighting for that new life. All different walks, but asking the same question, how do you conquer addiction? Is it grit, good genes, motivation? Experts want to know too. It's very difficult for us to predict who's going to get it uh, and who's going to fail. The earlier you can interrupt it, the greater likelihood you have of being able to have a sustained recovery. Their findings show this is the case for millions of men. One in five will battle drug or alcohol abuse at some point in life. And for these men, it's now. Why am I doing this? You know, I need to understand why I'm doing it. You know, that's the hard thing. You can't, you can't do it by yourself. And they're not alone. We will travel with them down this road to recovery as they work to turn their lives around in search of hope on the horizon. The road to recovery certainly isn't without potholes and pitfalls, but it is a journey from which we can all learn. If you know anyone battling drug or alcohol abuse, a loved one, a spouse, a child, friend, maybe even yourself, the next half hour just might change your life. Breaking an addiction can be overwhelming, but there are resources available to anyone who wants to quit, including, as you just saw, the Salvation Army. After the break, photographer Brad Horn and I will take you behind the scenes to a side of the Salvation Army that the public never sees, where the real work is just beginning, and where men who once lived to use, abuse, and drink are now desperate to live without. More on their road to recovery when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. It's not a nonprofit just in the business of recycling goods but also recycling lives. The Salvation Army allowed us unprecedented access inside its main warehouse and distribution center on Valley Road. But not many people know that there is also a residential hall on campus with 75 beds for men who either wander into the program themselves or for those who are court ordered to be there. We followed three men who filled those beds over the past 180 days for an intimate look at their struggles to stay sober. Yeah. 
sticks to your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The men in the Salvation Army's rehab program start every day with heads bowed. All right. Help each other out, gentlemen. Love you guys. Have a good day. And then it's off to work. Just feet from where they fellowship on the other side of the warehouse, this is where the men spend most of their days sifting through what others throw out. All your donations end up here, trucked in from thousands of households, from furniture to clothing, books, and unwanted toys. They all need to be sorted, priced, and made ready for resale. And that is how the men here earn their keep. But it's not just busy work. There is a purpose. Helping them to get back into life, getting up in the morning, having a job, things that uh, we take for granted, uh, these guys have difficulty with. The workload never seems to slow, with daily drop-offs making for long days. Can't complain. <laughs> if I did, it wouldn't matter anyway, you know what I mean? But the benefits of being here certainly don't escape most. What's the alternative? Many were homeless before the Salvation Army. Others were court-ordered here. And for some, this is plain and simply their last chance at a sober life. <laughs> So they work their way up the ranks, graduating from job to job based on seniority. But their placement is also strategic. A former engineer won't work with the electronics. And likewise, anyone who operated heavy machinery before rehab certainly will not be assigned here. The goal is to change all habits and steer clear of everything these men knew before treatment. But that's just the start. After their shift ends, the real work begins with anger management classes, AA meetings, spiritual guidance, Bible study, and intensive counseling. I don't believe you can get well unless you know what demons are tormenting you. These deep conversations go into the night, and then they get up to do it all over again. Every morning, Pat Nelson is one of the first out of bed. Pat's up by five to work out. I get up, say my prayers, do all that, brush my teeth, and then I get my clothes ready and I go down, I go in the gym. Where the 46-year-old father is not only training to live sober, but also to fight as a boxer once he graduates from this program, goals he didn't have a year ago. I didn't do nothing. I wanted to just sit around the house and get high and drink. Pat took his first drink at about 10 years old. He grew into a star athlete and says that's when alcohol became even easier to get. Plus, his best friend was an alcoholic too, his mother. My mom got killed in 1993 in a robbery attempt in Stockton. She got, she got shot in the head. Pat blamed her murder for his drug abuse, which landed him in prison over and over again. I knew I'm gonna get caught eventually. I would always get caught and then I, I go to prison. And after his fourth time, a judge ordered him here, where counseling classes and support groups gifted Pat the tools he needs to stay clean. It's been nearly five months. And now, with a private message to his mom in this balloon, he's ready to let go of the pain that triggered his abuse. Look how high up it is. Yeah. It's going up the clouds, it's going up to heaven, man. Were you ready to let go of it? Yeah, I was. I've been ready to let go of it for a long time. I just didn't know how. As is the case for a lot of these men who've come to rely on spiritual guidance, they walk to church together twice a week, which is where we met 23-year-old Mike, new to the program and recovering from meth. A homemade drug of choice that Mike says gave him energy for days, literally. I was going on a month without sleeping. But he constantly feared the power it had in his head. I'm really mental, very suicidal. You get, it just it eats you from the inside out, attacks your brain the most. As a teen, he binged, crashed, and sold meth on 4th Street. I knew a lot of people down there that does it, so I got rid of it quick. It didn't take very long to make a lot of money. No. And if he didn't have money? I had my food stamps. Sometimes I'd sell it and get a room. Sometimes I'd just sleep on the river. But finally, after wasting away, not sleeping, and hungry, Mike was arrested, jailed, and given one last chance here. He shared intermittently with others, saying his parents' divorce triggered his bad behavior, but he never fully opened up. Smile more, dude. Somebody will know what you're up to. Yeah. I usually am very quiet. The support from other recovering addicts that experts say is crucial 
never developed. Yes, yes. And the last time we saw him, well, it was standing here, quietly during worship. The director of the program says Mike was kicked out for stealing a cell phone. And last we heard, is living back here on the streets, which was also home for a man who says drinking is killing him. Growing up in a well-to-do family with two professional parents, Chris says he had little discipline. He started drinking heavily at 15 years old, but his first sip was much earlier than that. Six years old when I had my first drink. 24 ounce can of Budweiser. As a teenager, Chris was the life of the party, but his weekend drinking became an everyday craving. Some people can take one or two drinks and be down with it. Me, I can't do that. He'd black out, do angry things, then lost jobs, family, friends, and his home. He panhandled for money, slept near the river, and watched his back. Well, you gotta learn not to trust anybody, that's for sure. You know, uh, Anybody will steal from you in a minute. But after living scared on the streets, he caught wind of the Salvation Army Rehab Program, where he thrived, studied, and embraced the support, and where he also admitted he wants to be sober. you got to want it. And do you want it? Yes, I do want it. Very bad, so. But is that enough? Not long after our interview, while working his shift in the warehouse, this surfaced. In a donated dresser, a bottle of rubbing alcohol. And seconds later, everything changed. Yes, something as simple as rubbing alcohol. Coming up next, find out if Chris put his new skills for sobriety to use. Did the 12 steps work or did he fall victim to his decades long desire to drink? We will have the answer after the break. Welcome back. Most people would never consider chugging something like rubbing alcohol, which is toxic and incredibly dangerous to drink. But a desperate alcoholic just might. And one of Nevada's leading addiction psychiatrists explains why. Why over time the mind and body might crave it. And why one might cave to an overwhelming desire to get drunk or high. But first, here's what happened to Chris. With tremoring hands and eyes glazed over, Chris is back, fresh off another detox. Five weeks ago, he found a bottle of rubbing alcohol in the warehouse in a donated dresser and couldn't resist. We caught him on a, uh, uh, a PBT, which is a, a personal breath test, and we breath test everyone when they come back from meetings at the front desk. Chris blew almost a .04 and was kicked out of the zero tolerance program immediately. He spent five weeks out here again before begging to come back. And we sat down with him the day after his return with the first question, why'd he do it? I don't know, I gotta figure out what's going on inside my head to figure out why I do it. While it will take time to figure that out, it's clear right now, Chris is suffering. It does hurt, you shake, you feel nausea, that kind of thing, your blood pressure's up high. I feel kind of terrible. He says despite the positive attitude he showed to us on camera before relapsing, he actually felt depressed and kept it to himself. But he realized this time, more than any other, his craving is deadly. I can't go back out anymore. It'll kill me this time. I know it will, and I don't want to die. So as he waits for the pain of detoxing to subside, Chris is given a few days to rest before starting his journey towards recovery all over again. According to Dr. Mark Broadhead, one of two addiction psychiatrists in Northern Nevada, Chris's story is quite typical. You'll get stories where it was on the 10th time uh, that I finally got it. So you don't give up on someone after two or three tries? No. In 20 plus years of practice, Dr. Broadhead says that there are a myriad of genetic components contributing to addiction. It tends to run in families. Plus, the earlier someone is exposed to drugs and alcohol, and especially if their brain isn't fully developed, the greater the likelihood they'll become dependent. I used to come off these things and flip upside down, but I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't heal as well as I used to anymore. Take Chris, for example, who started drinking at six years old. Dr. Broadhead says the coping skills one should have learned as a child may not be fully developed as an adult because they've only relied on alcohol to cope. 
That, coupled with being homeless and having very little in terms of resources and motivation, can make it even harder to get clean. Basically, they're the sickest of the sick. Which is why Dr. Broadhead says the Salvation Army's efforts should be celebrated. Yes, their success rates, if they get anything, are uh, uh, are to be commended. While this program sits at a 5% success rate, Director Steve Charter, who's also recovering, doesn't give up on anyone. The alcohol that you drank uh, is not a normal alcohol that most people drink. It's regular rubbing alcohol used, uh, you know, for cleaning. You know, um, is there any fear of you dying or anything like that from drinking rubbing alcohol, which is very poisonous? I didn't think about that. Chris told Steve every time he goes out, he loses a piece of himself. No, now you're throwing stuff at me, huh, Phil? But when we checked in on him a month after his return, it appears Chris has gained something back, a little pride and some self-esteem. Tomorrow will be 30 days. Yeah, I feel a lot better. <laughs> and he hopes every day from here on out will become easier and easier to turn down the very thing that brought him down and instead focus on keeping his spirits up because Chris says it's clear now he's being given another chance. We're so pleased to let you know Chris is now more than halfway through the Salvation Army's adult rehabilitation program. According to Steve Charter, he's doing really well in his counseling sessions, classes, and with his personal accountability. And if he stays on track, he'll be giving a graduation speech in two months. After the break, a man who owned his addiction from the day he walked through the doors. But why is Pat's story so unique? The answer next. The Salvation Army's adult rehabilitation program is entirely self-sustaining. Your donations for its thrift stores fund the program, which costs more than a million dollars a year to operate. But to Pat, a recovering drug addict and alcoholic, this program is priceless. There you go, big man. There you go, baby. Pat is a fighter in the final round of his rehab program, throwing blow after blow in his bout with addiction. With his fiance Ginger in his corner, Pat plans to focus on boxing instead of booze after he graduates. Here I am, I got 41 days left, and, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm excited, and a little scared. You know, I know I gotta go out back to the real world, and I gotta be productive person in society. The father of three has long struggled with staying away from meth and alcohol, but two things are different this time. Pat says his faith in God is now first, and he's ready to marry this woman who's stood by his side from the beginning. I want to stay right for her and the kids. My, I don't want to see my 15-year-old boy turn out like me. Doctors' findings suggest those who have something to fight for, something they might lose if they relapse, have better odds of staying sober after treatment than others. During one of Pat's final counseling sessions, he said his family is his motivation, especially his future wife. Are you making better choices, you feel, than what you... I think I made the best choice ever. You know, she's, she works her butt off, two jobs, she never... She's never done drugs. I have a lot more to live for. The day has come. After six months of hard work, soul searching, and commitment, Pat prepares for his final chapel with the guys. Like always, they walk there together, where Pat's family is waiting to celebrate his sobriety. Inside, he leads everyone in prayer. And we know that you can do it, Lord Jesus. And then to a room packed with men, emotions float. I'm just a grateful very, very grateful alcohol, recovering alcoholic. And I, I love all you guys and I miss all of you. Thank you. Pat's time here is ending. His recovery is just beginning. But his daughter can tell he's changed. I can see the difference. Like, he's really doing it now. So I'm proud of him. I'm very proud. I'm like trying not to cry because I'm just like, I'm really proud to see it. And after four years together, Ginger is hopeful. Yeah, it's definitely who I fell in love with. I'm glad he's back. So with the sinner's heart. While some in this program will follow Pat's lead, it'll be harder for others. But regardless of how long it takes, they're here right now, battling addiction when they wake up and striving to stay sober when the sun sets, looking forward to their futures on a road to recovery with nothing but hope 
on the horizon. Your grace is enough for me. Pat is still living clean, sober, and now working for a local landscaping company. Plus, he's already in the rings and scheduling boxing matches. Congratulations, Pat, to you and your family. And a special thanks to the Salvation Army. If you or someone you love is interested in this life-saving program, we've posted a link to the Salvation Army's website, along with many other programs on ours, ktvn.com. I'm Kristen Remington, and thank you for joining us for this special program, A Road to Recovery.